Sure. Maybe just while your things are going over. I will. I'll try and do the night too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, welcome to the RMG. Uh, thank you so much for being here this afternoon um, on this beautiful October day. Um, my name is Hannah, and I'm an associate curator here at the RMG and the coordinator of our Artist in Residence program, which is funded by the RBC Foundation through the Emerging Artist Project. Um, and obviously, Noah was in residence with us uh, through the summer, um, and his beautiful exhibition, Heavy Water Machine, is now on view in Gallery A. Um, I went back to my notes to confirm this, uh, but Noah shared his idea for this panel in our very first meeting when he moved into the Artist Residency Studio across the hall uh, back in June. Um, and you had Katie's support in conceptualizing what this gathering might be and who might be present. Um, and I'm just so incredibly honored and really excited to welcome our panelists uh, to the gallery this afternoon and offer uh, some very brief introductions for everyone else in the room. Uh, so yeah, first of all, just gratitude to all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to read uh, some very light introductions. <laughs> Uh, and it might be when I say your name, you can give a little wave so that our, our friends here know who I'm speaking about. Uh, so Warren Harper is a curator, researcher, and project manager, currently based in Toronto. He is currently working on a curatorial research project at Goldsmiths University of London, UK, which explores nuclear history in Britain, and specifically the role played by his home county of Essex uh, in that story. Katie Lawson is a curator and writer based in Toronto. Uh, she has curated numerous projects and exhibitions and is currently working towards a PhD in art and visual culture at Western University with an interest in contemporary art and climate change. This year she was awarded the Natitian uh, Foundation uh, Fogo Island Arts Young Curator Residency. Uh, Dave Mowat has spent the, uh, 30 years working in various capacities at the First Nation level in Winnipeg, Wabasimun, Skugok Island and Alderville. His passion is researching and understanding the treaty, military, and settlement history of Southern Ontario as it pertains to Alderville, but also the Mississauga Nation as a whole. As a traditional wild rice harvester, he is also a staunch defender of Indigenous rights in treaty areas. Uh, Laura Murray uh, is a settler scholar in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, sorry, raised in Toronto. She's a professor of English and co-director of the graduate program in cultural studies at Queen's University. She has worked across a wide range of topics, including copyright law, media history, and indigenous history, and methodologies, including oral history, walking tours, and podcasts. Uh, Ryan Osman um, is a Mauritian photographer water re and re water resource specialist uh, based out of Wasaga Beach. He has worked with a variety of BIPOC athletes, environmental organizations, communities, and individuals to showcase their work and talents as well as learn from and listen to their ideas, issues, and stories. Ryan currently works for the NGO Water First, uh, which collaborates with Indigenous communities in Canada to address local water challenges through education and training. What a panel. <laughs> and um, I, I am going to pass things over to Noah in a minute, uh, and he's going to introduce himself as well. Uh, but as we enter into this conversation about Durham Region and the history of industry in this area, um, I want to respectfully acknowledge the land we're gathering on today. The RMG is situated on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. These are the traditional territories of the Michisaga, Anishinaabeg, and various communities belonging to the Haudenosaunee and Wendat confederacies. Noah's exhibition poses a lot of interesting questions about relationships. Um, as we enter into this conversation today, I invite us all to reflect on the role treaties have played in the relationship between settlers and indigenous peoples in this region, keeping in mind that the colonial state of Canada use treaties as a way to dispossess indigenous people of their land for the sake of development and resource extraction across vast territories, um, and as well, that we all have duties as treaty partners to heal this broken relationship. As a descendant of settlers and as a staff person at the RMG, uh, I will continue to strive to build trusting relationships, express uh, respect and gratitude to the indigenous people for their stewardship and knowledge of the land, and to act uh, within a spirit of reciprocity. That's all for me. I'm going to pass okay. it off to Noah. Um, and I am so incredibly excited for this conversation. So thanks again, and uh, take it away. OK, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Hannah. And um, yeah, just firstly, thanks to the RMG, and uh, thanks to Hannah and uh, the rest of the staff for making the last four months uh, a really um, profound experience and uh, well supported in, in, in different ways through uh, through the ups and downs. Um, I want to. 
thank everyone, uh, the other panelists, for being here and for the audience to be here. And hopefully, um, through Miles, I want to thank Miles for coming as well and, and, and uh, helping with the documentation. And hopefully, through that process, also making this conversation available to people through the website um, and through um, uh, having a recording also uh, in the exhibition space uh, eventually. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to um, sort of introduce a little bit about um, uh, sort of my, my thinking coming into the project at the residency. I very much started out um, uh, with thinking about kind of like nuclear issues uh, in, in, this, in this area and that uh, kind of emerged from a longer uh, body of research and artistic work that I call the legacy of matter and that's um, uh, kind of looking at Canada's uh, broader post-nuclear landscape so instead of sort of um, fixating on one particular site uh, it's about kind of mapping this network and the kind of relationships between them so that could be uh, uh, could be uranium mines it could be um, laboratories and also um, uh, spaces of uh, power generation um, and that very much obviously continued on as a main strand in, in, in the project um, and then another, uh, another kind of entry point, uh, which is kind of reflected in the textile work, was um, working with industrial uh, geosynthetic fabrics, and that was um, something I wanted to explore at um, uh, a different scale, uh, a more kind of bodily scale, uh, whereas these kind of geotechnical materials are often used uh, uh, sort of uh, at the kind of environmental level. I wanted to sort of investigate them and reflect on them as uh, uh, this sort of like highly engineered um, uh, technology that's like very much responding to an earth unfortunately uh, in a, a sort of in crisis and in, uh, and, and sort of like work through that at this um, through like the vocabulary of fashion and um, uh, and sort of in, through sculpture and, and the body as well so those are sort of like the like sort of the twin pillars uh, as sort of entry points and um, uh, Milena's not here, but I worked with uh, Fred de Nord, who is a local, local clothing um, manufacturer. And uh, I also want to thank them as well, because they were um, instrumental in helping me realize uh, those creations um, and also facilitated a lot of nice conversations. So that's my long way of saying that uh, that was a starting point, but uh, I very much come away with an understanding that, you know, asking questions about uh, nuclear power and nuclear regimes. Um, uh, is really asking questions about ongoing questions about fossil fuel use because um, very much the sort of like cultural life and production uh, and sort of everyday activities and practices um, that are uh, that are sort of uh, so so embedded within um, everyday life are very much um, still we're sort of like built on that uh, kind of petrocultural um, kind of history and so in many ways the idea of, of the nuclear uh, nuclear as a fuel source um, is uh, kind of inseparable from those kinds of questions so that sort of was a major sort of takeaway for me um, and I think yeah I think I'll also just sort of say a few words about why I chose to invite uh, these these uh, these guests to help me kind of unpack these themes so I, I went in with a, a lot of Kind of research groupings, kind of inter interconnected um, uh, topics of research, and of course, like within the four months, I couldn't sort of become experts in all of them. And you know, my uh, I wanted sort of my learning to sort of uh, sort of continue and develop through the conversation with people who have various different kinds of expertise. So, for example, in the case of uh, Laura Murray, uh, who I know through. Um, uh, I'm also a, a PhD student at Queens, um, very much about sort of treaty history and providing the historical context of this land, uh, which is research that you've done, I believe, in conversation with Dave, and then Dave uh, as well. I'm just sort of helping to sort of unpack those kind of like longer histories, um, which are not something that I know all that much about, although I consider it to be a very sort of uh, key aspect of, of, of the project that informs the project. Uh, and then I worked with Ryan, uh, so through a, a mutual acquaintance, a, a place called Surf the Greats in, in Toronto, which is a, sort of like a surf school uh, and also a kind of water uh, kind of advocacy kind of organization, I, I would define it as. Uh, put us in touch uh, in part because I wanted to find somebody uh, to help document this uh, swim that I did, uh, which, which is the sort of the, the base for one of the, the artworks uh, along, uh, adjacent to the nuclear generating station in Pickering. 
And so uh, getting to know Ryan a little bit and learning more about his practice, I, I came to understand that he wasn't, um, uh, although he is a, a, a great videographer and photographer and, and surfer as well and has a relationship with the water in that way, uh, his full-time job was for uh, um, an organization called Water First, which, uh, and he's a water resource specialist. Uh, so engaging with water issues uh, in northern communities. And so he really brings such a like, diverse kind of collection of, of expertise and experiences that would kind of help um, uh, kind of investigate uh, these sort of issues. And then uh, I was invited, I was um, introduced to Warren through Katie, uh, who, uh, as someone who had done a lot of work on nuclear issues, and uh, I read an essay that he shared, and I was really struck with how uh, it really kind of pulled together a lot of the things that I was thinking, but also uh, was um, doing it from a um, um, through the through the lens of, of artistic and curatorial research was obviously very uh, relevant to the way that I wanted to sort of explore and think about these issues. Uh, and, and the fact that it, that was actually happening uh, in a region in the UK that was uh, sort of very specific and situated uh, and sort of ongoing and long-term kind of engagement. Uh, and then, um, and Katie, Katie uh, and I um, went, went to school together, and, uh, but uh, amongst the many different kinds of research that she does uh, is uh, a lot of um, research and curatorial work around issues of water. And uh, uh, Katie was one of the um, curators for the first two editions of the Toronto uh, uh, Biennial of Art. And both of those had kind of water thematics to them. And so it seemed like um, somebody that I really wanted to introduce into the project and, and have help kind of conceptualize this conversation and could just bring so much uh, to that. So with that, I think, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Laura. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I think um, maybe what I'll do, Dave, is I'm gonna just, I'm gonna read like a couple little things from this article that I got here because it's most efficient than if I were in the long time. <laughs> um, but um, I, um, I've been interested in, in, in the history of Kingston, where I live now. I, I'm a settler, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, I've been interested since I got there, because it's a city that if any of you have visited, some of you live in, you know that it, it has a very strong sense of itself as a historical place, right? Um, and yet, of course, as many places that have that attitude do, it's missing a lot, you know, in, the, in, the, in, in, in thinking about um, all the different histories that happened there. So um, in, sometimes I was doing work in 20th century working class histories, uh, oral histories and so on. And then I guess it was, uh, I had done work in Indigenous history before, but I hadn't really thought about it in the Kingston context. It was so invisible that I didn't really think about it for a while. And then I think it was um, when uh, I Don't Know More happened and there was this slogan, we are all treaty people, and I thought, well, are we? Like, is there even a treaty here, you know? And it was pretty ridiculous. I had never thought about it until that time because I'd lived in the city for a while. Um, and so I thought I'd Google it and I'd find the answer, but Google did not provide the answer. So <laughs> then um, for about 10 years, I've been learning from Dave and Alan Corbier and uh, being like extremely obsessed with obscure archival documents and, and so on to, to try and put together a little bit of this um, narrative. And um, I don't know much about nuclear power except for my colleague Julie Salverson. So I knew about the Port Hope um, element of things. And um, I, I, I was struck, even today, just going to Darlington on my way, um, that there is a really, really direct um, connection between the attitudes manifested in these 18th century documents that I've been reading mm -hmm. and the attitudes that would be necessary to think that nuclear power would be a good idea and, and would be somehow safe and proper. Um, so I thought I would just read you the first paragraph of, of an article I just recently published called We Are the Ones That Make the Treaty, Mississauga Lands and Islands in Southeastern Ontario. And uh, this work I've done is, is about the, the area more or less from the Bay of Quinte East, um, but uh, it, as we will see, connects very directly to the claims that have been made about uh, the, the nature of agreements all the way across Lake Ontario. So this is just the beginning to give you a little background. In spring 1783, in the wake of British defeat in the American Revolution, Governor Frederick Haldimand began working towards the settlement of Ganyagahaga Mohawk allies and white loyalists at the northeast corner of Lake Ontario. 
By September, surveying was well underway around the ruins of the old French fort at Katarahui. It was early October when Major John Ross advised Surveyor John Collins that, quote, as the lands proposed for townships were not yet purchased, he should stop a few days till that was done, unquote. A group of Mishisagi chiefs, three Onondaga chiefs and one old chief from Ganazatake, met with Captain William Redford Crawford at Fort Haldimand on Carlton Island shortly thereafter. The resulting Crawford purchase concerning lands between the Bay of Quinte and the upper St. Lawrence River, back from the water, quote, as far as a man could travel in a day, unquote, is generally recognized as the first substantial land transfer from Indigenous nations to the Crown in what is now the province of Ontario. On the 3rd of November, Ross reported to Haldeman that, quote, as soon as the purchase was made, which up the lake extends about 45 miles, I sent some officers of the garrison to explore the country. They report that the lands in general of a most excellent quality, easily cleared and intersected with rivers on which are several falls where mills can conveniently be erected. And I think, you know, in the context of, uh, of knowing more about what you were doing with this project, like just over the last day or two and reading your articles and so on, I was like, I was really struck by this idea that um, they needed to get the Ganyuhaga and uh, British allies out of the U.S., right, because the treaty had been signed. They need to get them somewhere. But they, they also needed to get them to a place that was malleable enough mm -hmm. to suit their... Uh, expectations and needs of what land could do for them. Mm -hmm. And and so when they say that the lands are of excellent quality, easily cleared, right, that's, you know, a very clear idea that not all lands would, would suit that, but these ones could, and that they could be transformed um, in that necessary way for the kind of economic and social visions that they had. Um, and that they, they needed rivers but the rivers had to have waterfalls, and although that would seem like an obstacle, to the, the, a waterfall can always be transformed into a mill site. Mm -hmm. um, and so mills can conveniently be erected. Um, and so that's a, it's a far stretch from a nuclear power plant, but on the other end, it was the technology of the day that you know, was, pre was producing energy and was um, you know, making the land livable for settler ways of being and settler expectations about, um, about what made something livable? What could make it had to be exploitable in order to be livable. Um, and I don't know if you want to jump in on this right now, or I have a couple other things. And oh no, carry on. Should I come out? <laughs> um, then uh, let's see. Um, I guess maybe uh, uh, you know learnings that I am starting to do um, about the. Importance. So later on, as the Mishisagi people are defending their, in, their, their understandings of these treaties, and I in the end relied a lot on 19th century um, gatherings of information that uh, Mishisagi chiefs and other leaders gathered. They gathered together to compare their understandings of those 18th century treaties. And um, when they did that, they were really emphasizing the importance of shorelines and islands. And um, and, and they were emphasizing how they had never given those away in the first place. Um, and at first to me, I thought, well that, you're giving away a lot. Like, you know, because shorelines and islands are a small part of the land that has been appropriated. Um, so one of the learnings for me has been thinking about the specific values of those spaces um, in, in Anishinaabe culture and again, economics. Um, so, um, I think I thought it was interesting that the word island in English um, is related to the word isolation or the word insular, like just etymologically there's the same isola, insular. Um, and that's just, that's so culturally laden because it's just completely inappropriate to the way Anishinaabeg people understand islands. They're not isolated, they're in the middle of things, right? Because they're in the middle of the water. And the function is so critically important to the culture, uh, to the traditional economy. When we went to trial in the Williams Treaties litigation, when we went to trial, so one of the maps, the map that we produced for the Crawford Purchase identified points, critical and point, points of land and critical islands in which our people were, had been gardening on, uh, burying their people, or harvesting from. And of course, Ontario rejected the map. Uh, and Ontario's interpretation of the Crawford Purchase 
and our interpretation are really different, completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then the shorelines as well. Um, so, what what I had written here is that. Um, an Anishinaabe perspective emphasizes that islands defined by the water all around them. I mean, if there wasn't water around them, they wouldn't be islands. Right? <laughs> it's a really obvious thing to say, but you know, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, and um, that um, uh, they are by, the, by that water connected to other lands and wetlands, uh, home to fish, ducks, beavers, and manumen, spaces that appear on colonial maps and surveys as marking or embodying edges of property or jurisdiction or of land and water were and are the very center of Anishinaabe existence. The key activities of life and death from harvesting to burials took place along waterways. Council fires took place there. The harvesting and political work was intertwined. Um, and Leanne Simpson has written about um, Anishinaabe people not thinking of fish as a resource, but as a nation to whom the Anishinaabe had negotiated, ritualized, formal relationships that required maintenance. And Madeline Waitung, um, who's at uh, TMU in Toronto, um, has this concept shoreline law um, to articulate a philosophy for international relations just as certain plant relatives and animal relatives are brought to life along healthy shorelines between water and land certain ethics and qualities come to life in the shorelines of our embodied relationships to one another and this seems to me really related to your work and thinking about you know swimming through the water by clear fair play um, and um, so in, in Wei Tung's framing, it can be seen that in insisting that they'd never given up their shorelands and islands, Mishisagi people not only resisted misrepresentation of particular treaties, but resisted the very idea that a single colonial interpretation of a single one-time agreement could override pre-existing and continuing cross-species and cross-community relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe just one last thing I'll share. Um, and it's about gunshot, because um, I thought you were, you, you were going to want to pick this one up. Um, so uh, some of you who, who live along the north shore of Lake Ontario, I guess that's probably most of, most of us, um, will have heard about the gunshot treaty. And um, oh my goodness, um, it's such a complicated um, you know, thing to, to, to contemplate. Um, but um, uh, I, when I was looking at these 19th century um, Anishinaabe archives, and in particular the words of George Padash, um, who was keeping uh, knowledge from his father and his grandfather who had been at previous uh, treaty uh, occasions, um, he always speaks, he says, the Mississaugas decided to make the same agreement, and he's very adamant that there was this consistent strategy amongst all these different treaties which was to reserve a part of the mainland and the points and mouths of rivers and islands. The uniform naming and description of all the three agreements, because there were these three agreements that happened in the 1780s, 1811, and 1818, and Parash calls them that they're the same agreement. He's really insisting that they're the same agreement. The uniform name, uh, naming and calling them the same, because they had the same terms, even if they may not have concerned the same lands, embodies an overarching Mishisagi understanding of treaty diplomacy and also a consistent cultural and economic strategy. At the first meeting, Padash says, a line was imagined, as far as you can hear a shotgun from the shore. And as his grandfather explained, and this is the part that Ontario disputes, as his grandfather explained, this line shall leave me part of the mainland, all the points, islands, and all the mounts of rivers. So the, 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 the shotgun distance was not what was given away, it was what was kept. Okay? Um, and these shall be reserved for my hunting and fishing ground, and my children after me or the rising generation as long as they live. The gunshot serves as a measure of lands reserved along the waterfront, beyond which settlers are welcome to establish themselves. And that's then as far as a man can travel in a day. So there's like the waterfront is all Anishinaabe. Then there's as far as a man can travel in a day, which actually at the time would have been agreed upon. But then we can think of how, again, thinking of later technologies, um, how, how as far as you can travel in a day becomes a tool of power and, and, and like mm -hmm. claiming space too. Um, and um, so a gun would be heard at a much shorter distance as far as a man could travel in a day. At the time, it would have been maybe 10, 12 miles. When we get in the canoe, we're going to verify that. <laughs> um, 
and um, and so reserving more north and then then they were reserving also more northerly hunting grounds as hunting grounds. So it was a narrow strip of land that was was surrendered in these treaties between the shorelands and the hunting grounds. This is this is my understanding, and Will you will comment further. On this. Um, and I, I just think it's super, it's super, although none of these people could have anticipated the issues that we're all talking about, about water, um, this was all about water politics at the time, all about water politics, and the different valuations of water to these different political and cultural um, groups that were encountering each other. So. Gunshot. Um. So Crawford, Gunshot, and the Toronto Purchase, all within five years in the 1780s, all are problematic from the beginning. And it's Crawford and Gunshot that factor into the 2018 Williams Treaty Settlement Agreement. Um, so you, you mentioned misrepresentation or misinterpretation. That has been our biggest challenge, is the misrepresentation or mis interpretation of our early, um, <coughs> what are called pre-confederation treaty areas. And Gunshot, which runs along here, along the lake. Um, Allegedly, though, the but, British never kept any records. Though. Yeah, the British never kept any records. This is a strange thing, and this is what I try to always, always emphasize in my presentations. The Royal Proclamation laid down um, the sort of protocol around how treaties and lands should be taken up for, for settlement. It laid it out in the Royal Proclamation. It drilled down and, and, and uh, laid it out even more distinctly in the future plan for the management of Indian affairs in North America, which really never saw the light of day. So the Royal Proclamation of October 1763 was quote unquote ratified at Niagara in the summer of 1764. And the future plan for the management of Indian Affairs was written around that time and it specified how treaties should be, how the treaty negotiations should be conducted. And so in a short 20 year period, the British seemed to forget the rules as they wrote 20 years before. And, and so this is, of course, becomes a problem for the Cropper, becomes a problem for the gunshot. Um, so my understanding of gunshot is, is that there's no cultural, there's no way, it makes no cultural sense that our people would have given up the shoreline, that riparian zone, that important zone of harvesting, of meeting, of treaty negotiation, of uh, gathering, harvesting, burying your people. Uh, there's no, it makes no cultural sense that that would have been lost but it's been lost to time. So there's a couple of misinterpretations or a couple of interpretations about how the gunshot was conducted. One is that in surveyor's language, one chain off the water, which is 66 feet, and then the gun, and then the, the gun was shot. Or there's the, the interpretation that the gun was shot and as far as it could be heard, that would be where the line was drawn. Well, that's ridiculous because you think about this. Was there a man standing every 50 feet? <laughs> did he have a red flag and a black flag? And when he couldn't hear the gun, did he raise the black flag? Or it's kind of nuts when you start to, it's really airbrained when you think about how a treaty could be conducted that way. <laughs> when, we, when we reflect back on what the Royal Proclamation and the, and the Future Plan said about how treaties should be conducted, and then when we fast forward 20 years to Crawford or another five years to the gunshot, the British forgot that protocol. Um, so that's the, the, the problem is, it, is that our people lost access, one way or the other they lost access to the water. And the important thing was uh, along this area was some salmon fishery. And the salmon fishery was being um, impacted by the 1790s uh, around Lake Ontario. And the one issue was the creation of mills, and the creation of dams. That automatically starts, that throws a wrench right into the natural flow of the salmon fishery. 
and our people have been called, Elder Doug Williams would have called our people the Salmon people. Um, and so that immediately, not long after a gunshot, that becomes a critical issue in the survivability of our people along the lake. And, um, and, and then the misinterpretation, the influx of settlement, uh, Gilbert Patterson wrote an MA in around 1915. He estimated that within, um, by 1788, there were 17,000 settlers that had moved into this area. Mm -hmm. So that's a daunting number when you, when you start to, if you can possibly enumerate the Mississauga that were in this area, 17,000 settlers by the late 1780s is a daunting number. Mm -hmm. And so the the whole uh, balance is thrown out within, um, you know, less than a decade. And so the impact on our people is, uh, is profound. Um, you have, again, whiskey traders, American whiskey traders. You have um, the understudied subject of whiskey and alcohol and the impact of that on First Nations people. Fred Anderson, a great historian out of Colorado, wrote uh, The Crucible of War. If you're ever interested in reading a fascinating book about the Seven Years' War, it's called The Crucible of War. And he identifies this in one of his, in his footnotes about how alcohol is an understudied academic subject area in colonial politics and uh, First Nations colonial relations. Um, and then the failure of the Crown to honor, um, when we talk about the honor of the Crown and we hear about wor wording and we hear language about the honor of the Crown, if you reflect back on some of these early treaties, uh, if you want to call them that, I don't know where the honor of the Crown lied. I, I have a hard time with uh, reconciling that. Uh, and, not, and not only that, but racism. Uh, racism factored in uh, quickly in the relationship um, post Crawford, post gunshot. In fact, and no slight on Kingston, but um, uh, what's your name? Uh, Elizabeth Simcoe. She didn't help matters when she published uh, what our people were uh, an idle, drunken, dirty, unwarlike tribe walking around Kingston like they owned it. We did yeah. own it. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, um, the Kingston Historical Society, they also documented uh, some savage, savage commentary on our people and the view of settlers towards our people in the Kingston area. And one quote that sticks in my mind is that our people were dirtier than their cleanest hogs. That's pretty derogatory language. And so that's carried through the, um, that's carried through the written record through, through history. And so our people uh, at the Bay of Quinty, our people eventually moved to Alderville in 1835, uh, 37. And so by 1835 and 1837, you have municipal laws that are now coming down um, and putting, being put on the record uh, around land use planning. And that uh, causes such things as deforestation. Um, if you consider Wilmot Creek, for instance, Wilmot Creek, and the deforestation that took place around a lot of these important salmon creeks, what it did to the creeks, it, uh, it caused the water to become warmer. It caused uh, for uh, a great deal of erosion. And so within a short period of time, um, Samuel Wilmot, he's, he's over in Newcastle area by the 1850s, 60s, um, so within a half a century, the detrimental impact of treaties on our people's ability to sustain their traditional economies is profound. Mm -hmm. and, and so that enters into another period about Christianity and reaching out to Methodism and trying to find another way to um, uh, hold, keep a hold of the land. Um, and, and so today, um, when I think about gunshot, the impact, the misinterpretations, how our people lost a hold of the lake front and the lake shore, we were just talking about the 401. When I was young, 
so a lot of us didn't even know what existed on the south side of 401. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't, because we had no access to it. Mm -hmm. And we have lesser access to it now. Um, it's a wall, really. It's, it's like you call it, like the Berlin Wall. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's a barricade. Um, and so it's been very detrimental to the sort of, to the culture of the Mississauga, the Mississauga, which really means people of the Great River Mouth, or Shirley Williams said the Zogig is that place where the water comes up, comes up to the mouth of the lake. So the Mishizagig can be interpreted as people of the Great River Mouth, people at the Great River Mouth, or the people that live at the mouths of the many rivers. And those mouths of the many rivers were what sustained our traditional economy um, all along Lake Ontario. And so it's, uh, it, it, it serves industry and government well if they at least ponder and consider what the impact of that has been. And it's been detrimental and it's been profound. To me, much. And as a former chief, let me say how frustrating it has been, and it is, and it was, in dealing with industry all along Lake Ontario. Um, on the consultation side of things, I was consultation, uh, community consultation specialist, they called me at uh, Scugog, and then as a former chief of Alderville, we dealt all the time with uh, uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uh, with Pickering and, and with Darlington. And, and so um, from that side of the equation, um, I have seen how industry and government are a formidable force when it comes to our access to our former traditional lakefront economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you guess my turn. Uh, I would say thanks to Laura and Dave. Like, that was a lot of knowledge that, yeah, that most people don't know about. So I mm -hmm. just want to say thank you. That's, that's amazing. Thanks, Noah, for creating such a great battle for a discussion. Um, I, just, I might change gear a little bit from a more, um, I guess, like scientific and also um, as an immigrant, I'm a newcomer to Canada. So just kind of talk about how uh, the work that Noah is doing, I find is really important, not like from many different perspectives, but from what I've experienced too. And, and so, yeah, um, as was mentioned in the bio, um, I'm from Mauritius um, originally, which is a very small island, probably nobody knows about, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I didn't um, even know about it. Exactly. <laughs> it's so small. It's smaller than the GTA. But uh, the, the thing that's interesting about Mauritius that's kind of pushed me, I think, towards water conservation and understanding how it's, it's essential, but also that there's a huge gap about making a j bigger audience understand what's required for water conservation to happen. And it all kind of stems, I think, for me from where I grew up and how I processed things. And uh, in a certain way, you know, when you grow up in Mauritius, it's a country that had no indigenous people, but that was, again, kind of similar to what's happening here, uh, was that a lot of Europeans came and tried to settle on the island for resource extraction, settling on the shores and trying to go for resources extraction. And then for numerous years, and based on demographics of people, because in Mauritius you can very easily trace who's a settler or a uh, a youth from European descent or someone who's not, right? And looking at where uh, people are kind of located on the island and things like that, looking at resources shared and things like that, there's a few patterns that emerge that are similar to mechanisms used here. And, you know, as someone who's young, growing on an island like that, and knowing that, you know, you're obviously, you're an islander, you're connected to being in the water as a kid, like you, you just are in the ocean all day, you, you have this kind of sense of, uh, urgency that things are going wrong because everything is just slowly like what is called nature is just slowly collapsing on itself and it's not in your control uh, in a way so Mauritius is one of those places where you only have two percent of the original forest left mm -hmm. if you look at the reef it's deteriorating at an incredibly fast rate um, especially in the last year we had a, a Chinese tanker a kind of crash on the reef and that just went south and that's just one of a few stories as many stories like that but uh, in a way, what comes out of that for young people, I guess, like our generation, is that you get a lot of anxiety out of those things and powerlessness. And that's where I was like, 
what I decided to do was focus my attention on what conservation could be done. Uh, I'm an optimist, so I tend to try to, um, I, I like to be solutions oriented. And so for me, what that meant was to go and try to find ways to focus on water conservation and then better, get a better understanding of water issues. And that's when I came to Canada and, and, and did uh, undergrad in environmental engineering and a master's in water resources engineering. And again, like when you go through the motions of what that means, it's, it's nothing too surprising or anything like that. But what came out of it is that um, there's a bit of disconnect even between like what's being taught in terms of water conservation, what's required, mm -hmm. and what can be done, what cannot be done, and what do people understand about um, the topic of water conservation. Uh, I always found that there was a big gap, and I remember seeing that being very obvious when I tried to explain to my mom what I do, and she just doesn't understand what I do in terms of engineering because it's so weird and abstract. But Again, because of those gaps, when you're talking about water pollution or water issues related to shorelines and stuff, you, you, can, you can get a lot of engagement from people to help, uh, you know, help uh, address those issues because there's just that big communication gap that's happening here. Uh, and so after I was done doing my master's, I did spend a lot of time uh, trying to dive more into, well, what's good communication? Because I thought that was kind of interesting. And what I gravitated to Outcomes, it, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can only document like warming lake temperatures for so long until you're like, well, it's obvious it's getting warmer, kind of thing. Um, and so, one of the things that I learned also that became interesting was I, I started working um, for Water First, which, as described, was, is an um, organization that works with indigenous communities. And I was really f fascinated by, even early on, by the work that indigenous communities were doing in conservation just in general, uh, and my stats might be wrong, but you know, around the world, 80% of uh, biodiversity conservation done is done by indigenous peoples around the world. In Canada, the percentage might even be higher because they're the main people uh, really working on conservation of land and, and resources. So I was really uh, passionate and interested by that uh, when I started working at Water First, and we are uh, more of an educational and training facility for technical uh, water science related projects, but I thought it was really, what resonated with me was that when you go to different communities and hear about uh, similar topics related to nuclear uh, power plants and in, the impacts of treaties made on communities and looking at the impact on the community, but also the impact it has on everybody uh, because of what happens, it, it's quite astounding that more people don't connect to that and how we should be more alarmed at probably be providing more help to our indigenous counterparts to do what they're trying to do. It does matter. Uh, and again, we're talking about nuclear here, but that's just one of the things we talk about. We're talking about military uh, waste. That's a huge issue. Uh, there's mining, uh, forestry operations. There's a lot of that legacy of colonization and resource extraction and uh, relocation of communities and their impacts and stuff. And that's why when Noah uh, uh, reached out to me and we were talking about his project, uh, I, I found it really interesting. Like I was, uh, sorry, I have a hard time finding my words, but it was just so, it was so, uh, I found it so interesting because that's the type of project that I think can have a great impact if we keep diving into that space of looking at how really to connect. Into it. <laughs> well, yeah, but just like, you know, like diving into that space of like, yeah, like we have an issue happening right now in front of us. It's been documented for many years scientifically and somehow there's still no connection with uh, people who live around here. There's no understanding of the treaties and what, how that has impacted what's happening today. And I, I, I just kind of resonated with what I'm passionate about. And, 
that's kind of why I, I was super happy when, when Noah invited me to, to be part of this and help him film the, the swim he did. And yeah, I just, I just think that more um, platforms where that are multidisciplinary, that have more intention behind them from the beginning about being able to share knowledge, include more, uh, I think, uh, indigenous knowledge and understanding of what, what's happening is really important. So yeah, uh, that's kind of my, my spiel, but that's kind of why I, I was really fascinated by, by this project and what that could lead to. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, it also extending my thanks to Noah, Hannah, and RG with the folks. Again, uh, I'm new to Canada, uh, immigrant moved here a year ago, so I've not been here for yeah. very long. But my, my background is uh, so I'm a curator researcher. Uh, I've been working at the sort of intersection of, I guess, contemporary art and nuclear culture for a few years now. I'm working with artists that kind of engage with the, the matter of the, the nuclear um, over kind of long prolonged periods of time. Um, my focus has been uh, a PhD project that I've been working on for five years now <laughs> with interruptions and you know life um, but uh, focusing primarily on my home county back in the UK of Essex um, and how through sort of artistic and curatorial practices, there's a way, I think, and a, and a great capacity to kind of bring together the complexity, which we're all, you know, I feel like there's a special space that kind of um, art or the curatorial kind of opens up in terms of allowing for these conversations to have between kind of very um, different positions or disciplines or um, ways of looking at the same context, but from different places. Um, so I've been sort of looking at two particular sites in Essex, one in terms of nuclear energy production, so similar to Pickering um, or Darlington or this area um, in Essex called the Blackwater. It's an estuary uh, sort of landscape, uh, the Blackwater, where there's decommissioned nuclear power, waste storage, uh, proposed new nuclear power uh, station, and also kind of communities nearby which kind of um, have a very different relationship to place um, and kind of have a, a lot more sort of sensitive and um, considered way of kind of uh, living there essentially you know so like producing their own electricity their own kind of uh, uh, off-grid communities that are nearby um, so I've been kind of interested in how artists can make work to kind of respond to places like that so that's kind of the one element is the kind of uh, decommissioned nuclear power production the other side that Essex has also had a uh, quite a large hand in his uh, nuclear weapons development and um, the research and development of nuclear weapons and uh, nearby my uh, where, where I'm from um, there is a small island called Furness Island which is still owned by the Ministry of Defence mm -hmm. and um, it's where the, there was an at atomic weapons research establishment so a site there where Britain's first atomic device was assembled before it went uh, by barge to the Montebello Islands on the northwest coast of Australia to be tested. And that was the kind of beginnings of Britain's um, nuclear testing program on, uh, on unceded indigenous land essentially in, in Australia, um, primarily around um, the southern area of uh, Maralinga and Emu Field. So there was a long period of testing, just over a decade, where um, yeah, people were displaced and testing commenced in the, in the 50s and 60s. So I, one of the projects I've been working on, or was working on for some time for a, with an artist, uh, Gabriella Hurst, uh, is a project that, that looks at that history and kind of looks to kind of map out and think about the kind of, uh, I suppose, the networks and connections that um, the nuclear, that, or, that one could trace and doing that through artistic practice. Um, and that's something that I've been very interested with Noah's project as well, is this kind of how our, how our RMG has, has kind of facilitated this kind of long um, considered embedded process, which I think kind of uh, art's particularly generative to kind of um, throw up uh, sort of unexpected connections and, and ways to sort of think about place. Um, so that's kind of my, and, and, and alongside that I've also kind of worked in a, uh, I ran an organisation in, in the UK which kind of looked at 
sort of practice development and research and development for artists. So I find that kind of really interesting and sort of important. So I, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there because I suppose a lot of things will come out of uh, the conversation. Great. Um, and I will in turn, you know, offer a little bit about my own work and connections to this um, amazing panel, but uh, following that I'm going to be um, facilitating some conversation and discussion. We'll be opening to questions, so just to give you an idea of what is to come and really curious to I mean my brain is kind of already overflowing with possible like connections between um, the work that all of you have been doing. Um, in terms of my kind of contribution to this, uh, as Noah mentioned, we went to grad school together and that for me as a curator and writer was really when <clears throat> I was grappling with how to have a practice that was uh, specific to the context where I was living and working. Uh, I've lived in Toronto for 10 years, but before that I moved around a lot as a kid. So I lived in Oregon and Georgia and Florida and just wildly different environmental contexts, but also political and cultural, and um, was really grappling with, with how to feel connected to Toronto as a place and as an uninvited guest as well. Um, and part of that was um, contending with the, the broader Great Lakes watershed and the, the place that Toronto holds um, within that. And what I found so strange when I first moved there was just how disconnected and alienated not only myself but many of my peers felt from the waterfront. Um, and as you said, Laura, with the, your comment about the 401 and the south side being this kind of like inaccessible space or um, this way that we feel cut off from our divorce from the water. Uh, when the Gardner Expressway was built, being built in Toronto, it was called the mistake by the lake. And um, that as really being this, uh, it's like an amputation, like effectively like cutting off a possible way of relating to this body of water that is so, uh, has been so significant for time immemorial, um, of course, but also when we think globally, the Great Lakes watershed, uh, it's the largest freshwater reserve in the world. Um, it holds 20% of uh, the world's fresh water. Uh, and so I was, uh, during grad school, I was really thinking deeply about how to, you know, work as a curator in a way that would be sensitive to context and also how I could perhaps work on projects that would encourage curiosity about our surroundings and about these very layered histories and contexts. So I'm interested in, you know, similarly the way that art opens up discussions about contending with um, the histories of the places in which we live and work. Uh, and, you know, following that is when I was working for the Toronto Biennial of Art, which really was looking at Toronto's shoreline as a way of parsing out these indigenous and settler um, colonial histories and the really radical transformation that the shoreline has undergone, um, especially in the last 200 years. Um, and so that was not only the shoreline, but also thinking about, again, these um, interconnected tributaries to Lake Ontario and uh, the different ways that uh, so-called water management strategies have been implemented to make room for industry to have um, active or decommissioned military sites along the water. Um, and so before all else with the Toronto Biennial, um, which was a kind of multi-sided exhibition, um, that primarily commissioned new works by artists, so similar to the way in which Warren works as a curator working really closely alongside artists to realize new site responsive or specific um, projects, uh, became a really amazing way for me to also kind of ground in place and understand um, my connection to, to this place. Um, and before we started any work, we, um, we're in dialogue with an incredible Mohawk uh, 
artist, educator, performer, uh, Ange Loft, who is a Mohawk woman who um, is a part of John Lee's Theater and Arts, who does really amazing programming around kind of treaty literacy, like how to um, really honor and make visible some of those indigenous contexts which are currently not really accessible or present in our, our surroundings. So we worked with Ange knowing the incredible work and research she had done to author um, a document that was called the Indigenous Context Brief of Toronto um, and, and looked at you know all of these contested kind of um, treaties that had been made on the land leading up to the Toronto Purchase uh, and that was really the foundational document that was given to the artists before even starting to think about the work that they would produce for the site. So um, just to give a nod to, you know, that way of working in a place that is uh, really responsive to the slipperiness of context. Um, and I could go on and on, but I also really just want to um, open it up and kind of turn to the discussion and maybe, um, you know, some other aspects of my work what might come up in, uh, in the process of, of doing so. Um, but what I, I like to do before kind of offering my own uh, provocations, prompts, um, is I wonder if there's any questions that you have for one another, Noah included, kind of about what has already um, been shared today and, you know, recognizing that these are really like tendrils that kind of extend out from the work that you've been doing as a part of the residency um, and that this is a part of a, an ongoing research um, process as well. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have any specific questions, but no. I mean, I already learned a lot, and it's already I'm already kind of like reframing like my own research and you know, some of the work in the show as well through these various kinds of lenses and, and kind of like expertises um, too. And I mean, I guess maybe I'll touch on this too, but I am struck as a sort of a comment or observation, just you know, sort of islands, as, islands and shorelines as a kind of reemerging yeah. theme as well. So but I'll leave it to you to, to sure. guide us forward. Or unless anybody else has any questions or comments that way. I, what, well, one thing that struck me for a while, just in terms of how you articulate the project, in terms of um, landscape, and you talk about post-nuclear landscape, and it's something that I've got, um, just to sort of think, sit with that and think about what, what, does, what, does, what is or what does po a post-nuclear landscape mean? Can there be a post-nuclear landscape, for example, you know, um, given that uh, nuclear material perhaps doesn't really go away, it can only kind of be moved around. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, 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 just that kind of question mark of kind of when, if and when or how <coughs> does that transition happen? Yeah, it's interesting, like, I think it, it's always like that, that um, prefix of post is always, it's always like, are you talking about when something's finished or when something's begun? And I guess in my usage, post-nuclear means there was before the nuclear, and then everything after that, in part because of these like insanely long geologic time scales and it's moving around of material, you know, through through bodies and, and lands and waterways for you know, centuries and millennium, like that's all the post-nuclear. So it might just be a usage thing, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's kind of like you know after you know, before that there wasn't this this kind of science and, and technology, this kind of like rearrangement of matter, and and um, yeah, so. That's kind of how I use it, I think, or think about it. But it's also interesting to think that you know the post post or like the mm -hmm. you know what could that even be, or could we even conceptualize such a long, long time in the, in the future? And that's something I see as really um, like resurfacing through the work that each of you are are sharing, and Noah, the work that you're engaged with with your research is like how to kind of um, contend with these different scales of time. And like, what is the way into thinking about these longer reaches of time? Um, and so I don't know if, uh, I mean, Warren, if you would want to maybe speak about like the role of temporality in uh, thinking about the nuclear and kind of like imagining future maintenance and custodianship. Yeah, yeah, that's your sites. Yeah, because that will, yeah, that's the kind of. So we've, so I've been thinking about 
through my research, I've been thinking about the nuclear through, or thinking of a, a tool, I guess, or a way to think about the nuclear through uh, the historian Gabriel Hecht, who has written a lot about um, the nuclear, nuclear colonialism, um, and uh, she uses this term called the interscalar, uh, which I, I, you know, I, I, I read the quote because it's easier than me. So, it, so she, so she talks about the, the interscalar as objects and modes of analysis that permit scholars and their subjects to move simultaneously through deep time and human time, through geological space and political space. Mm -hmm. So, what she does, uh, there's a text called uh, uh, Interscalar Vehicles. Uh, I can uh, share it with anyone who, who <laughs> might find it interesting. But what she does is she writes about you uh, pr primarily. Uh, Gabon and the fact that in Gabon uh, there there is it's a really kind of uh, fascinating kind of um, sort of history in terms of uh, in terms of nuclear culture or the nuclear. So uh, back in the um, I think it's uh, in the 1970s they discovered that in Gabon there was deep uh, um, natural nuclear reaction happening in Gabon due to the kind of uh, due to the the sort of um, Elemental makeup, I guess, of the geology at the time there was a natural nuclear reaction that happened underground. Um, but so with that, there's been a, co a lot of um, a lot of uh, scientific interest. But also uh, within that area, there's uranium mining and other kind of aspects of uh, of, of of effects of of the nuclear industries essentially. So what she does through that writing or through her scholarly work is use uranium as a kind of object to kind of allow her. Or, or, or as a tool to kind of think about different temporalities, different spaces, whether they're geologic, uh, geographical, or geographic or political, different times, and tries to kind of use uranium to hold all that together in some kind of way to kind of, I guess, hold that complexity, whether that's sort of these disparate temporalities or, or, or spaces. And I've been really interested to try and think about this kind of the interscalar or through that lens how kind of artistic or curatorial practices also have the capacity to do that in some way and in um, in that kind of practice based uh, research led kind of element of work like what Noah's undertaking for example there's a way to sort of hold that complexity but a really kind of uh, you know almost impossible leaky indeterminate way because it's sort of still quite slippery in many ways um, so I find that as a kind of interesting framework to think through this kind of really, particularly when the context is giving you it's so complicated, complex, fascinating, overwhelming at times. It's a way to sort of manage that, I find, in, in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of one sort of method I've been thinking about a lot in terms of, in terms of, in terms of that. Um, mm -hmm. But just generally in terms of, yeah, time frames with the nuclear, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's wild because, you know, you, you, you think about waste which is produced, it, it takes some of it's, you know, unsafe for human, you know, unsafe to humans and, and, and others for 100,000 years. How do you manage that? How do, how do you communicate that? You know, when, you know, what sort of form of communication can that take when one wouldn't even really know how one would communicate in 100,000 years? You know, language evolves and isn't active and... Uh, you know, it, 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 it's not a static thing, is it? So how does how does one sort of even manage that? That's just one consideration to make, right? And that's without thinking about uh, the ongoing infrastructural maintenance of managing and taking care of something so dangerous for such a long period of time. So it's mm -hmm. it sort of just snowballs from there. You know, uh, particularly when thinking about the fact that when we, you know, are Thinking about the nuclear industries, we tend to not consider storage, or people don't really think about storage and extraction. You know, in many, in many senses, when it's considered clean, clean. it's yeah. considered clean. You know, because of the, the tiny part in the middle where you know fission's happening and therefore heat's being produced and energy's being created. We don't think about the the extraction from uranium mines, which are predominantly on uh, indigenous land. Uh, I think seventy. Over seventy percent of uranium mining happens on indigenous mm. land, predominantly Kazakhstan, Canada, Australia. 
Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, the same with waste storage, the same as nuclear weapons testing, you know, so it's kind of all of that messy stuff is conveniently excluded or, or not really considered in, 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 my, in my view. You know. that's, that's interesting because like, uh, you know, like the part about the time scale, I totally agree, like it's really hard to communicate, like, because you have so much science about it, but communicating that is complicated. And even the part about where 70% of uranium extraction happens on indigenous land, that's also fascinating, right? Because the power dynamics into who it affects is so different. And that's one thing I found interesting when we were filming, I was, and you were talking about the disconnect from like indigenous people to the lakes now because of the treaties, right? But I found it interesting when you were looking at the nuclear power plant here, right? Like you have a big plant and you have the waterfront nicely made for settlers to enjoy it and everything. But for communities, it's, it's such a different impact in terms of even just looking at community impact on um, how a nuclear plant operates with uh, settler communities um, or indigenous communities and what's the legacy that it leaves behind. I found that really fascinating when we went to film and stuff. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. really good points. And maybe it's worth mentioning that that stretch of shoreline that Noah swims is otherwise completely inaccessible because of the way that land has been settled for you know, industry. Um, and I thought it was super interesting, like being able to get that kind of bird's eye view or like a different um, perspective on that landscape and the way that like the industrial and recreational spaces are kind of knitted together. Um, but I was wondering on this subject of, of temporality or, you know, relating to kind of like deep time and imagining uh, future stewardship of the lands, thinking about the slipperiness of, of um, our past and the um, the kind of irreconcilable uh, understandings of treaties. I was wondering if there was anything that Dave or Laura you wanted to, to comment on. Um, I just wanted to touch on not you know, now, now that we're getting into the depth of the conversation is on the related to the spirit of the land. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's an underwater spirit called Mishibishu. And um, that was the underwater serpent played an important role in our people's ability to fish and to harvest from the water. And they would have to appease that spirit. And, um, and it was taken very seriously. And so I ponder with the deforestation, with the um, changing temperatures in cold water streams, with the obstruction of the salmon fishery by, by mills, um, how that also impacted on the spirit of the land. Um, so if you think about Lake Ontario, our people's economy, traditional economy, went north from the lake, up those rivers, up those valleys. And the settler economy went this way. So you have an intersection of economies. You had York, you had the main York Road, and York to Kingston, and then to Montreal. So you had this important uh, colonial economy that traversed east to west, mm -hmm. and you had our economy that traversed north to south. And so that intersection, it's, it's important to consider that because it physically was profoundly established once those mills were put in, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does that all impact on the spirit of the land and ultimately the spirit of the people? And, and I don't think it's, uh, and you know, it might be considered, it might be considered more now uh, because of the time that we're living in, but at, during the time where the history was being written by the, the victors, mm -hmm. um, where the Nishinaabek voice was silenced. Um, that was not something that was well understood, but it's something that I ponder more and more, is how the spirit of the land affected the spirit of the people, and ultimately the, uh, the not 
welfare may not be the best word, but the uh, the well-being of the people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's a subject that's been well um, well enough considered. Um, how that connection between the, the, the big lake, the minor the minor streams and the rivers, Ganaraska, the Moyer, you name it, the Don River, mm -hmm. up into the Haida land, and, and you know that whole connection was severed mm -hmm. by that east-west mm -hmm. economic development. Mm -hmm. That's a critical piece in the history of the Mississauga nation. I think that the the history of the Don especially is kind of an interesting one to gesture towards tangentially too, just as an example of a river who, you know, the violence inherent in a kind of like forced straightening of a river and a moving of a river mouth to another location as just really like embodying uh, the kind of... Um, it's arrogant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the, survey, the surveyors recorded that you, a cat could walk on the back of the salmon in the Don River. Mm -hmm. The salmon were so prolific. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine the effect that that had on the Mississauga. Well, then there's the Trent Severin, right? Trent Severin. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Another, that... another, just about the Trent, the Trent Severin. Yeah. Our people were complaining. The Mississauga, at the credit, were complaining as early as 1806, maybe earlier. Our people were complaining uh, at the mouth of the Trent River, and the Mississauga Eagle at Rice Lake were complaining as early as 1815, 1811, of the detergent being put into the Credit River uh, at the worst time of year. Any time would be bad, but it's the worst time of year uh, during the salmon run, and also. The cutting of timber, when the British gained access to our treaty lands, they um, reserved to themselves great stands of white pine mm -hmm. in the shipbuilding. Mm -hmm. And when they would cut that timber and float it down the Trent River, it would, of course, you cut in the winter time, you bring it to the edge of the lake in the winter time, and in the springtime, you float it down the river. And what's happening in the Trent River in the springtime? The spawn. And so those booms rolling down the Trent would destroy the spawning beds. And so there's been so much impact for 200 plus years that it's almost it's a difficult task to try to sort of quantify all of that destruction mm -hmm. and impact. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, just to hear a little bit of this more recent part of the conversation is uh, is something that's connected to some of my other research, but also my interest in, in these topics is, is the role of infrastructure, both from a care and maintenance point of view and from mm -hmm. times and um, uh, the temporalities uh, and, and, and durations. And that's something that in many ways I was thinking about throughout the project and, and, and in my other research, but um, but in here, and, and also traveling the 401, you know, commuting in from Toronto, these kinds of horizontal Connectivities and um, you know what kinds of infrastructures are built to serve what kinds of purposes and the kind of politics around that you know are, you know so much of um, like in Canada so much infrastructure is built for resource extraction and you know and um, yeah that's something that is not as present in this particular project necessarily but it, it it's amazing how fast it kind of comes out in conversation because it's it really is one of these um, these kind of like like these very material forms of these kinds of systems that we're kind of talking about, whether it's a highway or a mill, um, you know, or a, uh, yeah, or a, or a power generation station, or um, a hydro corridor, you know, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, um, yeah. What, what or what are the objects of care of different okay. economies or different systems? Yeah, and each so one the, is also the, has the 401 has to be looked after, the fish aren't looked after. Yeah. You're going to choose yeah. who, who, what are you looking after? But either way, it's a huge, I guess, in a sense, almost any culture or economic system has to uh, care for something, has got to keep it going. And how do you decide what you have to care for to keep your world going? Yeah. And that's what carries value and. Yeah, I um, just on the 401, mm -hmm. kind of getting up 
away from the nuclear piece, just to sell in it, salinity mm -hmm. the oh, soul. Yeah, yeah. Right. I broached this with Darlington, I broached this with the MR or the MTO, never got a credible answer. Right. Oh, we're, we're working on beet juice or what <laughs> have you. Uh, but the, <laughs> the level of salt that is put on the 401 that ultimately makes its way into the, what is it, 18 coastal wetlands between Toronto and Kingston or Trenton or, um, that's just a, that's a, that's a question that should be continue, that should continue to be asked. Mm -hmm. It's also a question that connects to like, just like what scales are important, like somehow, oh, it's just a bit of salt or it's just a little thing by the side of the road and you know, you can get kind of obsessed with being a little, no, like there's so many different kind of relations there without even being precious or delicate about it but it is like it becomes like a major transformation uh, but uh, it's not the right scale to sort of like um, garner the kind of attention you know even in the way that you know your letters are going unanswered or something right. you know it just does not register whereas maybe it's kind of to circle back to what you were just saying like you know if there's um, uh, like if, if, if the 401 if you can't, I mean, obviously, it, is, it just is inconvenient for everyone if you can't drive on the 401, if it's traffic, if it's shut down. Actually, it's inconvenient even if you can drive on the 401. Even if you can, but I mean... I mean, it doesn't even do its job of getting people efficiently from one place to another. But it certainly, but it certainly <laughs> registers in a different way when, you know, like when the, the trains are kind of like blockaded and, you know, like resources can't be shipped around and they can't, you know, all the, the whole kind of logistical side of that as well. Mm. Um, you know, that's something that is like clearly a problem or a matter of concern or something. So another issue is the transportation of nuclear waste mm -hmm. and the movement of such. Every piece of Ontario was treaty land. Every piece of Ontario was, it's Indian land. Like that bridge says in, mm -hmm. in, in Sault Ste. Marie, Garden River, this is Indian land. Um, and that's a something, that's a been a contentious issue for the Anishinaabek Nation. The Anishinaabeg Nation is one of the four PTOs in Ontario, um, and it represents 39 Anishinaabeg communities, including Alderville, Skuga, Alderville, um, and Christian Island, um, and then all the way up into Northwest Ontario. And so the, the movement of that is a critically important issue, and we know about the um, deep geological repository that's been contentious um, and even um, the movement of uh, medium, low to medium uh, radioactive waste is also an issue of course Port Hope, we know what's going on in Port Hope. So that's a huge issue and there's been um, resolutions put forth regarding that and they seem to go nowhere. So the movement of radioactive waste and what to do with it while it's being touted as green energy, uh, clean, et cetera, et cetera, what do we do with the waste? That's the question that I can't seem to get a good answer on. There's, a, there's just like a banal fact about the video um, of, of the swim, and you know, like, yes, there's the, uh, there's the, uh, there's the reactor buildings, and then there's the, uh, the turbine hall, and then the, the sort of, the, but then as you go east along the site, there's just all the uh, the dried cask storage of the used fuel, um, and that's in part because there's nowhere else to put it. It has to be transported at some point, but it's just there. I mean, it's right. You know, it's sort of uh, again, it's a kind of this like kind of willful kind of obfuscation of that just material fact that there's something that needs to be done with that. And it's just sort of this assumption well, in the future we'll have a solution to that, whether it's burying it in rock. But yeah, I mean, it's just it's literally right there, like swim by it. And I think that goes back to the arrogance that you were pointing to, and I think it's important to note that kind of like arrogance in there's this fallacy of containment, um, that these things can be contained and that, you know, even our bodies are like discrete and separate entities rather than like entangled and fluid and shifting um, bodies of water as well. Um, or maybe some belief in bureaucracy or professions or something that there will be somebody who will know how to take care of this 
in future when, well, so, you know, the, the Crown couldn't even remember what it agreed to uh, 200 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, right. And even though the British, like, the British record-keeping, colonial record-keeping system is like, was state-of-the-art, man. Like, they were pretty good at this, but they were also terrible at it. And there was like, only one person working in the Indian department, or two, maybe, one and a half. Or they're very selective about what got recorded and then what. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that, um, oh, I've got so many things. <laughs> but on the radio coming in, driving in, I, I, heard, I grew up here, but I live actually on the Turn River now, um, out near Campford. And I heard that in Australia, uh, there has just been the defeat, and you mentioned Australia, the defeat of a, a move to um, have an have uh, indigenous participation or or, or a indigenous voice um, built some backward you know reverse engineer into the constitution, but it got defeated, which is really pathetic. But what is you know like 60 percent you know no vote in Australia. But it just makes me think, you know, I was thinking a lot about restoration. I know the Alderville restoration of the Black Savannah really well, which is a fantastic project. But, you know, you kind of think in a way, well, you got to just keep moving forward. But in another way, you have to do some kind of backward fixing, like this idea to fix the Constitution, you know, in, uh, in Australia. So I'm wondering about comments about that. Like, how can you sort of um, try to uh, uh, structurally change things here in Canada, you know, so that there's more indigenous voice, you know, like it just seems like there's all this lobbying all the time, but there's no real good, you know, because of the treaties, there's no real good basis, like how can you sort of backward fix in some way so that there's more of a solid platform, I guess would be. My, well, my question. The, the, big, the frustration as a chief was that um, you're always on your heels. The Section 35 in the Constitution, while it says um, all here, hereby all, all hereby uh, existing treaty and average rights are hereby confirmed, something like that, affirmed. Um, the beauty of the, con the government was that that was an empty box that had to be built. And, but the thing about the Constitution and the thing about First Nations communities is that we're always at the mercy of the Crown. First Nations are an animal of the Crown. The Crown meaning England, the Crown. You know, and, and his and Canada, his, his right, his majesty the King and right of Canada now, right. Right. Uh, they are an animal of the crown. Um, and uh, the Indian Act, you would not believe what it's like as a chief to work within the confines yeah. against the Indian Act. Well, that is what it we is uh, yeah. the most frustrating and disheartening mm -hmm. part of my work was that. Environmental, for instance, there's nothing in the Indian Act that speaks to environmental protection. Nothing. Right. The, only th the intent of the Indian Act was to undermine and destroy our self-governing institutions. And it um, slowly, events, it slowly over time, um, corralled the people on the reserves and it controlled them from what's been said, cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, today, right to this day, dealing with the Indian Act is one of the worst things you'll ever experience as a chief. And it's all wonderful and go wonderful and all great to be a chief. It's all that's all great. And then when you're in, when you're in your office, and you're waiting six months for a letter yeah. from the Minister of the right. Environment, yeah. um, or you're banging your head against the wall de dealing with David Pacini on excess soil, uh, it's just it's insanity. It's 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 arrogance. Mm -hmm. It's insanity. Humiliation. What's that? Humiliation. It's humiliation. It well, I'm wondering if there is there any way to start an initiative. I didn't. I'd never heard of an initiative like this. I don't know anything about Australia. But is there any way to start an, an initiative that's like that? So. You but we already have Section 35 in, in the Constitution. Right, but you. And, and look where we are. And look where we are. Can be amended, mm -hmm. though, you know. Look where we are. It takes seven provinces to amend the Constitution. Right, we got our own, yeah, we got other constitutional, yeah, yeah. I, I hear you, yeah. Um, 
Oh, well, nice. I, I'd like to hear from you in a way, because oh. you're doing some grassroots things mm -hmm. that sort of from the other end about trying to... Well, I was going to say uh, one thing that you mentioned um, was about how, um, I guess, like, indigenous rights are just different, like, by the way the Indian Act was made. Like, so there's no such thing as indigenous rights. No, that's what I mean, yeah. exactly. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what I was going to say was, um, again, like, I'm, I'm a settler, right, so my job is to just be quiet and help and listen, right? And in a way, like, I had a conversation with a knowledge keeper who made the same comment you made, and he said that the biggest issue to start with is the way the Indian Act is designed, right? It's not, it, 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 it from the get-go puts indigenous people below what Canadian settler rights are. Right. It's yeah. not even the same playing field at that right. point, right? Yeah. And um, another thing he... Because um, it only governs reserved land. Yeah, right. that's right. right. And one thing he said, and I, and you know, the more time I, I work on projects and get to understand better the history of what's happening, um, there's no acknowledgement of indigenous knowledge and science, because indigenous people have had their own sciences for a long time, validated methods and stuff, and none of that is incorporated mm -hmm. in those agreements exactly. They're just fully from a settler perspective, and that's what few knowledge keepers I've talked to are kind of explaining to me that's one of the issues with making it also hard to amend anything because they're not designed for that and don't incorporate indigenous voices like as much as you think they do right. uh, in terms of uh, being able to, to express themselves and have their destiny in their own hands kind of thing. So I just thought that was uh, really interesting when you mentioned that. Which kind of brings me around full circle. Mm -hmm to the land acknowledgements. Mm. I have a real hard time with the land acknowledgements because we lost, a whole, this is what we're talking about, losing hold of the lakefront. And, um, and the 401 being that ribbon, that barrier. Um, I remember being in the Ajax Convention Center for a meeting and I think the MNR was there and, and one other Ontario ministry and the land acknowledgement came out and it, I just had to put my hand, mm. my head in my hands because all I could see was 10 lanes of four and one of the window of the Ajax Convention Center. And I'm wondering, what land? Um, and so it's problematic for me, the land acknowledgements. Land acknowledgements are not, uh, they're not new. Land acknowledgements are steeped in history. When one nation would move in or come into another nation's land, there would be a council, there was a heavy protocol about moving in, coming into another community's territory. The dish with one spoon, for instance, uh, is a good example of protocol. Uh, and harvesting, for instance, it's, it's about harvesting it in, and moving within, intertribally within other land bases to harvest. And there's a protocol behind all of that. And that protocol is not followed, even amongst our own people. So. It's kind of hypocritical, um, but, the, but the land acknowledgements are not new. They're steeped in history. But to hear them now, sometimes they cringe. Because we're, I'm a, one of the original movers and shakers of the Alderville Black Oak Savannah with Rick Beaver. And that's our baby. And we can acknowledge that yeah, we can acknowledge the heck out of it. We can acknowledge <laughs> the heck out of it. But to say that we're stewards of the land, to hear Northumberland County in a county council meeting say that we're stewards of the land, I just cringe because we're not. Mm -hmm. what, do we, what stewardship ability or authority do we have along the lake, the Coburg waterfront mm -hmm. that's Absolutely. blocked out by condominiums? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these lakefront communities, they were wastelands, they were industrial wastelands, they were polluted. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to acknowledge the Aboriginal people, the Indigenous people who are stewards of the land. That makes me cringe, mm -hmm. uh, because we're not stewards of that land. We were take, we were moved off that land. We're stewards in Alderville, <laughs> and we even have our own challenges being stewards in our own, in our own communities. Uh, but so just uh, for the audience, the, the issue of the land acknowledgements is, is really difficult. Maybe not for everybody, but it's certainly difficult for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. That might be a good place to, I mean, I'm 
sure we could continue to, to, to dialogue for a while. Is there any other questions? I feel like that's a very good kind of summation point. Maybe, uh, I have one like, yeah, yeah. question about just these, you said the, the waste that's sitting there. Yeah. Do you know where that is going? Uh, where No? No, I, I, we'll I, know or I mean, I think, or, I think they both know where it's going to go. Like, there's a plan for it, and the plan is that it's going to get buried in one of these deep geological repositories. Like, like it's, that's not even an assumption. That's the sort of, I think, even the legal, because everything needs to be licensed. So I think legally, that's where that's going to go. But that site doesn't exist. So many times just leaving it by the side of the road. Well, I, think it was like the, the I think it was like the like the like the Soggy Nation or Bruce area. Right. The, yeah. They um, they uh, they didn't agree to the yeah no. give the big thumbs down exactly, um, and so it just sort of rests there. But everything is like has to be yeah like legally in order to even create that waste there is actually like like it's, it's it, they have to do it legally and so but then part of that is the sort of there and a lot of the reading I did about that site was the sort of like decommissioning plan as well because I had some idea of um, there are uh, there has been some thinking about what might happen to that land in the future because those actually Pickering it's supposed to uh, its end of life is supposed to be well it's supposed to be in 2024 yeah. and yeah. now it's 2026 yeah. <laughs> and so there's a lot of plans in place about what's going to happen to that fu in, in the future and some of them are kind of like funny like it could be a film studio, you know what I mean? Like some of them are, it could be, you know, another form of energy production, so it's much more kind of like infrastructural or it could be recreational. So, I mean, maybe another phase of the project or another kind of conversation is talking about like restoration, the future, is that, is that an opportunity? You're talking about the post-nuclear to um, have a different kind of set of relations that happens at that kind of shoreline. Well. So, so not only can we not think millions of years in the future, apparently we can't even mm -hmm. think to next year when it's yeah. supposed to be. <laughs> well, I mean, but it, it, kinda, it kind of connects back to what I what I tried to express uh, in my kind of like opening uh, opening um, thoughts was just sort of like I mean the reason why that's such an attractive option now is because on the one hand there is the science and the expertise and they just did this. Um, uh, they did this project at Darlington uh, in order to refurbish some existing reactors, and now they, it's more realistic to do that at Pickering, in part because it's it's clean energy, like it's not burning fossil fuels, and so. But in order to sort of like maintain that way of life, which you know is a, a sort of a different conversation in a way, but uh, you know to maintain the grid, let's just say like the electrical mm -hmm. grid, uh, it's a much more attractive option because it doesn't you know it doesn't pollute in quite the same way. But I mean, I think part of the reason for this project and these conversations is it just comes with different questions. I mean, I think that that's, some of them are overlapping, and then some of them, you know, um, kind of extend into different kind of temporalities and um, yeah, different kinds of uh, yeah, kind of kinds of issues for sure. Because yeah, the only I know of one, sorry, I know of one in Finland in uh, there's a place on Klo, which is the it, they've got a deep geological waste repository there. Um, I think it's open now. Uh, but it's about a thousand meters down, and they have. That's the only place which they've they've proceeded. They haven't in the UK yet. They need community consent for it in the UK. It's the largest environmental project that they will they have on their hands, and they haven't even started yet. And we have the same issue back in the UK of just above level, ground level waste just sitting there. Yeah, there's amazing um, in, in pools which were designed to, to last sixty years or something. You know, and it's kind of what we we need to think a bit further ahead than fifty or sixty years. You know, it's. So it, 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 there's an absurdity to it that just does that just unfounds to me, to be honest. But there was a question over there. No, it's not really a question. It's just a comment. The image of the swimmer along the shoreline is just so timeless, right? So yeah. essential. It's prehistoric. Yeah. But then every time, every time the, the GoPro lifts its head and you're swimming, you see the you see the, the landscape as it is. So, you know, quite evocative. Yeah, it is. It's pretty really stark. Good, good to, yeah. Yeah. I planted him in the. <laughs> <laughs> I got my line. Somebody had to say something nice to Noah. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for that. I, yeah, I that appreciate it. Well, it's also, it's like an Im embodied way of trying to reestablish a connection to a shoreline that has been, um, yeah, removed um, yeah. from public access. and. I thought there was something kind of funny with the um, the tree 
term around the distance one can travel in a day. <laughs> I was thinking about well, how would it differ, you know, how far one can swim in a day or like, um, yeah, trying to relate differently to bodies of water which like sustain in these different ways of life, even if they seem completely incommensurate. Um, I have so much I could keep saying. I know, I wasn't trying to cut off the conversation. I just didn't want to keep people um, longer than they uh, they planned for. So, No, it, I mean, that's why the nuclear is a good entry point to a lot of conversations. And there's even artistic questions that we haven't even had a yeah. chance to sort of unpack. But. Or like those legal frameworks came up, and there's so much there, like just to point to another kind of um, aspect of this conversation. I've been really interested watching recent conversations around um, <coughs> cases where bodies of water are granted legal personhood mm -hmm. um, as a way to kind of within a colonial legal framework start to think about how like the care and maintenance work and the, um, the well-being of non-human entities around us, whether that's the, the salmon as nation, mm -hmm. the body of water as an entity. Um, so it's, it is totally something that as soon as you kind of get into talking about these connected issues, um, just has so many, yeah. The mayor of Port Hope, uh, I forget her name, uh, I met with her, uh, she's been floating the, the notion of, mm -hmm. of the river uh, as a person. Mm -hmm. There's a few, there is one in Canada now. I think Australia actually had the yes, first one. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Which one, what would be the one in Canada? You know? I can't remember the name, I'll have to get back to you. Then again, we're not that good at human rights, so... Um, I know, know. <laughs> I know. Human rights and natural bodies, I don't know. We're at Aboriginal rights, so... <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I, following up, though, before you leave, Andre, I thought oh. the thing about swimming along by the uh, boys, it, it's also, it's... it's um, it was a very striking image, but it's also, there's a bit, it's so strange that they have these boys there sort of like you'd have a swimming pool or a beach. Yeah. Like yeah. that that's what they're using to tell people where to be. Right. And so it has this kind of recreational yeah. vibe to it. No, it's really uncanny kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah really. it's like a paradox, right? The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also telling the fish where to be. We were chatting about that a bit earlier, like the net. As being one of like few mechanisms to try and keep other species like out of the immediate vicinity of the water as it's connected to that plant. I don't know, no, I think it would be really interesting for you to, to comment briefly on the experience of the swim. Because yeah. we, we have the document of it, but I think this is a really beautiful opportunity to also share some of that um, like experiential knowledge. Um, sure. Temperature came up as like a subtle thread earlier. Yeah, uh, yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, I think sort of the the intention was to have this more kind of immersive uh, engagement with with the landscape or with the waterscape, um, and uh, you know, part of me was thinking about those kinds of traditions and like our history of like you know sublime landscapes and you know sort of. Uh, representations like landscape painting and photography uh, and then part of me also um, you know it's this sort of idea of, of what I've been kind of I've sort of borrowed this term of sort of technical lands and it's sort of like the perimeters of, of areas of space that are sort of uh, made inaccessible because they're sort of deemed technical so military industrial energy producing and uh, and then also the last kind of element was that um, I realized that in order to really engage with any of these nuclear sites, these post-nuclear sites or landscapes across Canada, often the only way you can get up close is on the water or on the river. And actually that came out of a conversation I had with somebody who worked um, um, for the government because I was like, well, how do I, like, I, want, how do I get up close? Because they wouldn't let me kind of like, they wouldn't give me any access. And like, well, you could like get a boat. Oh, okay, like to do that. And so, in terms of the actual like embodied experience, like yeah, it was. I mean, you know, the, there was a lot of a fluctuation, fluctuations in temperature. Uh, there was a moment I described earlier on that towards the beginning where suddenly it became.
there was an area uh, sort of to the to the east side of the building, and they they sort of constructed like an outflow channel, and and there like this sort of um, it was almost like a bit of a riptide, but it, I think it was manufactured through the way that they had engineered um, the shoreline in order to outflow the water, and there was like a current there, so that you know I had to really pick up the pace, put out a different kind of effort. Um, and then I guess like just more of an observation as like I I was really struck by this this like intense like like beauty and variation of um, uh, well both when like the different kind of colors like where it was sort of deep enough there wasn't really visibility of like the like the lake bottom uh, of all the kind of like greens and blues and other things that I was seeing but then also where it was shallower as I was sort of more approaching the end just like so many types of algae so many types of patterns on the bottom. I mean, it was almost this sort of like incredibly lush sort of experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was very like, uh, uh, just sort of got lost in it in a way at a certain point. So yeah, and then that's uh, all kind of information. But then it was also a weird kind of field work. It's sort of like information back from the field, you know, and you know, kind of uh, referencing that kind of um, uh, kind of practice as well. You know. I think it's easy to get lost in that film too. Yeah. And maybe that's a, um, this also being the reception to celebrate the work that you've done in this residency, I can imagine maybe this transitioning into like just informal discussion and maybe also continuing some of this um, actually alongside some of the, the work. Sure. That feels like a good moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to hear about the River of the Personhood though? I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I have to look that up. <laughs> Um, so it's it's the Magpie. I mean, it looks like Magpie, but I'm sure it's Magpie because it's in Quebec. And so it's on the north shore of the St. Lawrence, but way to the east. So if you think about um, the edge of the Gas Bay, mm -hmm. it's just directly north from there. And it's the the Inu. It's the Inu Council of Ekwenichi. Sorry, I taught for a long time, so I tend to do this. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Inu Council of Ekwenichi. Um, and the Mingani Regional Council Municipality declared, they call it the something else. So it became a legal person in 2021. It has nine rights, among them the right to flow, maintain the biodiversity, biodiversity to be free from pollution, and to sue. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I wonder yeah. who the lawyer is for that group. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty That's cool. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with your uh, invitation, I will just take a second to congratulate Noah on, oh. on his show. And I would, yeah, I mean, we can continue this conversation, but like... All right, thanks everyone. Yeah. One observation I had was when I saw the buoy buoys below the surface of the water, Yeah. and the fish, what did you observe of any fish getting into? I didn't see any, there was just a the few fish that I encountered, right. my, my fish friends there, uh, yeah, they were just sort of sort of near it, but definitely kind of on the exterior of it. Yeah, it's not like there were porpoises and going to come up and hang out with them, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, but that was, yeah, it was a good moment. But yeah, they sort of, there's some that just sort of seemed to kind of like float by on the outside of the net and right. can only speculate what's on the other side of the net. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. I saw some minnows, I guess, you know, obviously there's a certain scale of life that is deemed acceptable. Which has always been one of the questions when we've met with uh, Pickering and or Darlington, is that entrainment, impingement yeah. piece. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. quantify that for us. Tell us in a year, an annual, yeah. give us a number annually, what's being literally vacuumed into the... Into the uh, I mean, there was a sort of the poetic version through like the camera, but then there was like, you know, like, you know, put some instruments on me, I can like measure some other things yeah. you know, right, right. next time. Or, right. You're well, available for scientific yeah. studies. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> but just one more question before. What uh, has OPG, are they witness to this yet? Yeah, and I, we, what, we had one person who seemed very enthusiastic about that we engaged with them, but then they sort of fell away. So you just did it then? Yeah, yeah, we just did it. I have I mentioned to people who have connections to OPG, and they're like, how did you pull this off? Like, <laughs> sure, like, you he just did like, it. Like, there was someone patrolling line. Yeah. I was like, there wasn't. I'd send it to Todd Smith, the Minister of Energy. He'd be interested to see it. <laughs> yeah, no, send him the video. <laughs> yeah, send it to him. He's a pretty good guy. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Next time you go back, there were going to be like yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of cameras yeah. and. Uh, I have his access. If you want to send it, I'll send it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Final question. Just that, just in terms of like next steps for you in terms of the yeah. project. Like, how, how is this sort of a sort of punctuation point where it, the, the the project will continue? Like, how are you seeing this develop? Um, if it yeah, no, I think there's sort of like two answers. One is that I definitely want to continue looking at different sites across Canada. Like, uh, and um, uh, there is in particular, well, there's there's some sort of. I actually have a background in architecture, so there's some historic reactor buildings that I would like to look at. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also a site in um, Winnipeg that I've been trying to get to, and I've sort mm -hmm. of been, had the support to go see, but I just haven't had the opportunity, um, just outside of Winnipeg. And that's actually where they prototype the, uh, the deep geological repository. They tunneled out a large sections of the bedrock there, and they did a lot of ecological experiments. It's called the White Shell Laboratories. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they did like, and that's where you know my interest in ecology um, and the nuclear kind of really kind of come together because they they irradiated and, and geometry too because they irradiated like a perfect circle of forest to see what would happen. And you can kind of still see from the um, from the satellite images. So there's a few sites like that that I would kind of want to engage with, and each you know sort of taking with me some of this kind of research and conversation, especially. Uh, and then specifically to the work, yeah, like I think that. Um, sort of taking some of that video material and then exploring some of these future looking scenarios and, and maybe even some of the conversation, like quite literally the voices from today into that as more of a sort of like a single channel film. Uh, and also some of the sculptural things I think I want to continue to explore too since you know the time frame was relatively short. So a lot to can continue to, to, to develop for sure. Sorry, I just have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> How is the film Disseminated. Um, the Williams Treaty's First Nations might be interested. In this. Yeah. Well, that's always isn't that always a question with artist film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how yeah. is it disseminated? Yeah. Like, I actually don't know. I mean, you know, there's the you know there's like film festivals, um, which is sort of maybe what I you know a, a, a slightly more yeah like a, a new a different version could could circulate in that way. Right. But it is it's actually a it's a big question. That's one that I've always sort of had. Yeah. The indigenous or First Nations might be interested in. Yeah. Yeah, we should, we should chat for Yeah, we yeah. should, definitely. Very cool. Yeah. I think another round of applause. <laughs> um, I just want to invite everyone to grab a snack if they want. There's also, in this little fridge down here, some cold drinks. And uh, my gorgeous colleague, Carol, has made some coffee and tea that's out in the hallway. So oh, please help nice. yourselves. Um, and with Noah's permission, we'll uh, lift the ban on beverages in the gallery yeah. space, <laughs> and then if you want to be sipping a drink and also be chatting in there, if that, that's A-OK. -okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks again to the panel as well for... Yeah, thank you everyone for yeah, thank you. This is great. There's a new film that's just coming out, or just being shown at the moment, Down Wind, that is about the issue um, around Trinity. Um, but it's come, it's come out this year. It's They're like, in Australia? Uh, no, in, no. In, in the US. Oh, yeah, right. around, like, uh, uh, around sort of New Mexico, Mexico okay. um, yeah, yeah. Nevada, sort of, and little part of the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just. Um,